Okay, so now chapter 16, trauma, stressor-related, and dissociative disorders. Um, so trauma-related disorders in children. So we're looking at the clinical picture of a couple of different types of disorders. So post-traumatic stress disorder, we all know that is PTSD. Um, that can happen in preschool children. There's also something called reactive attachment disorder and disinhibited social engagement disorder. So PTSD, of course, can happen in children. Um, it actually can happen in an infant also, all the way up through every level of childhood. And usually that is because of um, child abuse and or neglect. So they experience PTSD symptoms perhaps a little differently from adults, um, but nonetheless, any age group can have PTSD, especially we do have to think about our kids that are being abused. There is something called reactive attachment disorder and disinhibited social engagement. They're not real common to have, but that reactive attachment disorder, if you think about um, the goal of when you have a baby and developmentally, one of the biggest developmental tasks is to bond and to really get that sense of trust with a, a significant caregiver. So these kids that have this reactive attachment disorder have not had that ability of bonding and trust. Therefore, they don't really trust anyone. They, um, they are very quiet. Um, they don't um, develop relationships with others um, to any extent, whether that would be an adult caregiver or even their peers. So they are very detached and they are not, um, not developing relationships with other people the way they should be. Disinhibited social engagement is kind of the opposite where they will just, they have no judgment. They will go with anybody. Um, they have no stranger fear. They will just get into a car if somebody says, here's some candy or want to come see my puppy, they'll just run and go. And you might think, well, some other kids might do that too. But these kids really do it to the extent of they will sit on someone's lap that they don't know. I mean, so they really are putting themselves into, um, into danger by just having absolutely no fear of strangers at all and no judgment as far as who is a good person or who might not be um, a safe person to be with. So the cause, of course, we are all different genetically. We all react differently to trauma. Um, so sometimes you may see a situation where somebody has something very traumatic happen and they come out just fine and somebody else has the same trauma and they need quite a bit of help and they have quite a bit of symptoms. So everybody reacts individually in a unique way to trauma. And um, we have to think about the neurobiological, that the um, trauma dysregulates the neural pathways that integrate emotional regulation and arousal. So then sometimes that, um, and actually I've read articles too where there's actual changes in the brain that occur. And this is some of what it's talking about um, that that happens when people have very traumatic events. And so their, the regulation of their emotional responses and arousal, which really um, has a lot to do with anxiety, can be very impacted. So there's triggers, um, the, the hypo-aroused state leading to dissociation. So sometimes people dissociate as a means of, a, of like coping with something very difficult. Lots of different theories here, polyvagal theory, psychological factors, attachment theory. Um, you know, we don't we really need to kind of go through all those just to get an idea of, of course, it is a very complicated etiology. So there are definitely environmental factors that we have to think about. Um, so if you're a child, you are dependent on adults. You're not an independent person. So that puts that child at even greater risk for you know, for developmental delays and for difficulties. And there can be external factors that support, um, that help, uh, that are helpful or that add to the stress of that child. We're always applying the nursing process. For a child especially, really for any age, we should always be doing a developmental assessment. And so we should be looking at our, um, at our stages that we learned right back from the beginning of nursing school and look at Erickson and see where they should be at for their age and where they're actually at for their age because then we may have to change some of our nursing interventions based on that. So we make our diagnosis, identify outcomes, implement and evaluate. So I think you know that pretty much by heart by now. There's three stages um, of intervention with children. So 
The first is providing safety and stabilization. So we're going to revisit this later when we talk about adults because really it's very similar with adults also. But safety and stabilization, those are kind of the immediate, very high level needs. Stage two is reducing that arousal and regulate the emotions, emotions through symptom reduction. So when we think about arousal, we have to think about um, high levels of anxiety. So if somebody has like a um, heightened arousal, they may have a, a huge startle response. So maybe somebody tiptoes up behind them on soft carpeting and says their name very quietly, but they may jump a mile out of their chair because they're of their, their heightened arousal. Um, we also, stage three, we just really want to catch these kids up on their developmental and social skills, help them develop a value system so that they can go on and become successful adults. So interventions with a child, for a child with PTSD, first and foremost, and really for almost every type of illness and patient ever, is establishing that trust and safety, and of course even more so important with a small child. Establish trust and safety, use developmentally appropriate language, so we're not going to be explaining things to children that is way beyond their ability to comprehend. We can teach relaxation techniques. Usually an older child or teenager is very able to learn these. If you have somebody who is a preschooler or toddler, sometimes kids that age like to imitate. So maybe imitating and going through relaxation techniques and having them copy you might be pretty successful, but we can't expect them to learn it and to be able to do it on their own. We might use art and play to promote expression of feelings because these kids can't necessarily talk about what happened or how they're feeling, but perhaps they can draw a picture, or if you give them some toys to play with, they can kind of act out their feelings, and that really does help them to um, to feel better. We want to involve caretakers in that in that one-to-one -one, um, work with the the patient unless they're the cause of the trauma, in which case we would not be wanting to involve them. We want to educate the child and the caretaker about the grief process. So even though you might think, well, what does grief have to do with this? But um, if you have any kind of trauma, it's very stressful and there's always grief that is associated with having something very stressful. So grief isn't just for losing somebody through death. Grief can be um, can happen with a variety of, of circumstances. We want to assist the caretakers in resolving their personal distress. So I said earlier that um, anxiety is contagious, right? It's catchy. So if a parent or whoever's the caretaker, if they have high amounts of anxiety, then that anxiety is going to be transmitted to the child. The child will become more anxious in response to the adult's anxiety. So a big goal would be to help the parent or caregiver to reduce their personal anxiety level so that they can be more helpful to the child. And we're always going to coordinate with social work um, for protection, so meaning like the social worker is usually the one to call Child Protective Services. However, it's not to say that a nurse could never call Child Protective, but if there is a social worker available, many times they will they will take on that task of, um, of calling. And of course, we're mandated reporters, so we absolutely need to call Child Protective or make sure somebody does if there is um, a child that's in our care or teenager that, um, that has experienced some trauma, abuse, or neglect. So adults have post-traumatic stress disorder, so they re-experience the trauma that is part of their, their symptomatology. So they could be reading a book, uh, sitting on their couch, and all of a sudden they're right back to where they were before. Um, perhaps, perhaps they were in the war, and um, maybe a car backfires, and they're, again, sitting calmly on their couch reading a book, but they hear this car backfire, and they just jump, and right away, immediately, they're back to back to being in the war, and they're um, you know, worried about being hit by shells or something like that. So it's a re-experiencing of that trauma. And then they also may avoid stimuli associated with the trauma. So perhaps if, um, you know, if you were mugged in the parking lot of Walmart, perhaps you're going to avoid going to Walmart altogether or try to avoid parking lots. Anything that's going to remind you of that trauma. There are persistent symptoms of increased arousal. So in other words, like I just 
um, described to you, um, that hyperarousal and that increased startle response and that increased anxiety type of response. Um, and they can have alterations in mood also. Besides anxiety, they can also experience, an, experience some depression and even some suicidal ideation. So those are some of the major symptoms that we are seeing. So then we're always going to identify outcomes, the implementation, you know, those are the interventions. And, um, and then we have an, an advanced practice intervention called EMDR. And I have heard some, yeah, some positive and negative things about EMDR. And honestly, I would never test you on that, but it's an eye movement uh, desensitization reprocessing type of technique and you have to be an advanced practitioner in order to do this and I guess I've read some articles that say it's just absolutely useless and other people that claim that it's the like the miracle worker therapy for for people that have PTSD so anyways it's kind of interesting so anyways going back to the top of the slide so for the outcome, our goals are really going to be around managing their anxiety, helping them with their self-esteem, because they may just feel very badly about themselves because of whatever they've been through, and, and that's going to help their um, ability to cope. And again, that implementation, that same three-stage model that we just talked about for children, psychoeducation, teaching people about their disorder, teaching them how to manage their symptoms, how to manage their care, um, and medication can be very helpful. So um, a medication that I've noticed the doctors ordering more frequently is mini press. And they are giving that at night because that can help with some of the intrusive thoughts and especially the nightmares that people experiencing people experience at during the nighttime. There are a couple other medical type meds that you might see for um, PTSD besides the mini press. Propranolol or Indorol, a beta blocker, sometimes is used for that hyper arousal and panic. Um, clonidine, which is also um, was used as a first um, used as a blood pressure medication, but that can also be very helpful in um, addressing those hyper arousal and intrusive like. Uh, the thoughts just kind of breaking into their consciousness can help with those types of symptoms. Certainly antidepressants that help with anxiety, antipsychotics, um, benzodiazepines. There might be any number of different types of medications that are used um, to help with PTSD. So then we have something called just acute stress disorder, and that is usually something that's happening immediately after a traumatic event. So you have that traumatic event, um, it could be the same type of event that could cause PTSD, um, but perhaps this is just a single episode rather than perhaps sometimes PTSD, people have repeated episodes and, and they, they are exposed to something very traumatic and stressful over a longer period of time. Um, the, but the symptoms have to persist for at least three days and they have to be diagnosed usually within a month. And usually after the month, either they have a resolution of all their feelings or it could possibly become PTSD. One of the things that could help this acute stress disorder is debriefing. And I'm actually going to relate this back to um, to nurses and um, EMTs, police officers, firemen, people that deal with trauma all the time sometimes need to debrief because this is something that this acute stress disorder is something that any type of medical professional could experience if you have a very stressful event happening in your emergency room or out on the field wherever you happen to be working. So debriefing is actually a very, um, very important intervention for somebody with this disorder, especially I'm thinking about uh, those of us in the medical profession. So um, there are other trauma-related disorders in adults, so adjustment disorder. Now this is interesting because I have not seen adjustment disorder as a diagnosis in years. It seems like it was used um, greatly when I was first becoming a nurse in uh, around 1981. Many people were diagnosed with adjustment disorder. I'm just wondering, and I don't know for sure, but I'm wondering if it's possibly because the, um, the insurance companies may not pay for an inpatient stay if somebody has an adjustment disorder. Perhaps they're thinking that it could be something that could be handled on an outpatient basis. And honestly, probably most of the time it can be, but if somebody does become really debilitated by this and they um, perhaps are suicidal, they absolutely need 
and inpatient stay. The difference between this adjustment disorder and many other types of disorders is that in an adjustment disorder, you're likely with help and with care, with psychotherapy, medications, short-term, whatever, you're likely to go back to your original level of functioning. So really almost anybody could experience this adjustment disorder based on something that may happen in your life that's really difficult. But usually, again, you're going to go back to your normal level of functioning. And for some disorders, you may not go back to your normal level of functioning. So dissociative disorders, they occur after significant adverse experiences and traumas. And um, so, you know, think about something so difficult that you actually, your mind has to travel elsewhere because it's just too emotionally and or physically painful like to be in your own body at that time. This is an unconscious defense mechanism that happens. We don't purposely say, this is awful. I think I'm going to put my mind in another place right now and not even experience what I'm going through. So it's unconscious. So the individual responds to this stressful event with severe interruption of their consciousness. Um, and it does protect the individual against overwhelming anxiety through emotional separation. Um, I have an example of somebody who dissociated. Uh, I know it's just, it's kind of a, a distressing type of example, but um, I'll share it with you because I, you know, the, the person who shared it with me was very open about her experience. So I um, worked in Rochester, New York, and on the unit where I was working, there was a medical student, and she told all of us nurses about an experience that she had with, um, she was jogging in a park that's nearby the hospital, and she was raped. And she said that she realized, she heard somebody screaming, and it was almost like she didn't know, she had no idea what was happening to her body at the time. But she heard somebody screaming. And only later did she realize that it was her that was screaming. So she actually dissociated during that traumatic event and didn't even realize that it was her that was screaming. So again, it's going to protect that person against overwhelming anxiety. So we have some different types of de de bleh, dissociative disorders, depersonalization, derealization, dissociative amnesia, and dissociative identity disorder. So we're going to kind of talk about those um, in a little bit. And we're going to think overall, in general, the psychological factors, environmental and cultural. So the psychological factors certainly are if somebody is dissociating, they are experiencing terrible trauma. Either it could be a one-time event, um, such, such as I just described with that medical student went through, or it could be just kind of chronic, ongoing, terrible trauma that people are put through. So, of course, the, those are the psychological factors, the environmental. Again, your environment is very unsupportive, and perhaps your environment is downright hostile. Cultural considerations, um, definitely people from different cultures might have um, different ways of uh, that they might emotionally express or react to a situation. And um, I do have an example of that. I do remember... Um, taking care of a girl who was Latino and she was, she actually was having some, I believe some long-standing sexual abuse from her father. And when she was in the hospital, she became very psychotic and she had to be restrained. And many of the things that she said was kind of a mixture of her religious values and beliefs and her psychosis and the sexual stuff all kind of got kind of jumbled together, but it, it seemed to be a very, very much of a, of a culturally driven way that she was um, kind of expressing what she was going through. So depersonalization and derealization. Depersonalization is the focus is on yourself and derealization, the focus is on the outside world. So depersonalization is very uncomfortable because you find you kind of feel like you're observer of your own body, like you're outside of your body, you're observing yourself and you're not really living. Derealization is the focus on the outside. And again, you feel like your surroundings are unreal or distant. You might feel mechanical, dreamy, or detached. 
So those are very, some very uncomfortable types of symptoms people might experience. Dissociative amnesia, the inability to recall important personal information. So that could be your name, your address, your phone number, um, if you're married or not, the name of your spouse. Um, so it, that again, very, very difficult thing for somebody to go through. Usually the result of a traumatic, um, a traumatic or stressful event that's happening. You may have, along with that dissociative amnesia, kind of a subset would be having a dissociative fugue, and that is um, characterized by a sudden unexpected travel and an inability to recall one's identity. So um, on my desk at LTC, I have an article about somebody that was in Dallas, Texas, and he just took off one day and his wife had no idea where he was and so she put up posters all around um, Dallas and other cities that were kind of nearby and putting up posters like you would have a lost child and actually somebody finally did recognize him after he was gone for I think at least a month or so and the guy had no idea who he was he had no idea that he was even married and he just kind of took off one day and kind of traveled sometimes people end up they get on a bus and they end up somewhere and they don't even know where they are they had no plans to go somewhere but they just kind of end up somewhere so I worked when I worked in the psychiatric emergency room there were many times that we'd find people like that who just kind of got on a bus and ended up in our, in our emergency room. So, but again, if you're having these, these types of issues, then you, it is usually in response to a very stressful event. And if you've had one episode, you are definitely likely to have another one in the future. So dissociative identity disorder, we used to call that multiple personality. So maybe that's a term that you're more familiar with. So it's the presence of two or more distinct personality states, and each personality, or called an, they're also called an alter, has their own pattern of perceiving, relating to, and thinking about themselves in the environment. So the alters can be a male or female or both. They can be um, heterosexual or homosexual. They can be, um, they, they can have totally different personality styles. They can be an extrovert and very friendly and seductive and sexy and dressing, you know, prov provocatively and all that. Or they could be very quiet and shy. So the personalities are all really very different from one another. So you would want to take a history um, if somebody has symptoms like that where they are going into different types of personalities um, the history would usually be severe unrelenting trauma over a long period of time and when you have me in clinical if you want to bring up and ask what some of those situations are i will tell you in a clinical group i just don't want to um i don't want to record it because some some of the things that, that um of people that i have taken care of they're just so stressful you almost can't even stomach you know what they have been through so i really don't want to put that on a tape but if you want to know i'll tell you in clinical so we have to look at that history we have to look at their moods and especially if they have a fluctuation of different types of moods and different types of personality styles definitely huge impact on the patient and family um, the patient at first usually is unaware that they have different personalities and in sometimes in therapy it'll come out that they have different personality styles. And um, the goal is to get that person to understand that they have these different personalities. And then long-term goal would be to reintegrate all of that person, all those sub-personalities or alters back into that one host personality. Um, but that usually takes many, many years. And that would not be the role of a regular nurse. Perhaps an advanced practice nurse could um, be the one to do some therapy, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, anybody like that. So an advanced practice mental health professional would be the one to actually do the therapy. But as a staff nurse, you might have to be taking care of somebody. So one of the interventions that we always use with dissociative identity and part of our assessment is to figure out who are we talking to. So 
you might already be used to asking people, what would you like me to call you? And so that's a very appropriate question to ask. Who am I talking to right now? Or please tell me what you would like me to call you. And so they may say Susie, but actually their name in the chart might be Mary. So, you know, you, then you're realizing that, oh, okay, I'm talking to one of the alter personalities. So, and that personality is going to be very different, perhaps, in many ways from the host personality. So suicide risk is always an important thing to think about with patients with this disorder because I guess it's been my experience that every person I've ever seen that's had this disorder has at least one of the personalities that is suicidal. And if one of the personalities is suicidal, then obviously the whole body, you know, the main post then would be suicidal. So if that personality came out and they were in the forefront and the other personalities were in the background and that person um, decides to take an overdose or cut themselves or hang themselves or whatever, they are at, even though the other personalities don't want to commit suicide, they are at very, very high risk to commit suicide. Self-assessment. So maybe you're already thinking, oh, come on, Mary, are you kidding me? Is this real? Um, and if you do feel that way, I kind of don't blame you because honestly, um, I probably used to think that way until I actually started taking care of patients with this disorder. And it is actually downright um, alarming and almost scary when you see the difference in how they relate and how they look, their voice changes, um, and all the different aspects when the different alter personalities come out. So I absolutely feel this is a valid diagnosis. Um, and many other health professionals do too. But there are some people that are health, mental health professionals that feel that these people are trying to get attention. They're making it all up. Um, they're fabricating it. Well, you know, and they don't think it's a real diagnosis. So there is some thought out there that it is not real. But I guess I can tell you I'm a believer only because of the people that I have actually worked with. And again, it is downright alarming when you see how differently they can come across from, you know, one interaction to the next. So let's keep going on here. So planning. Uh, um, safety, obviously, is the very first most important thing because of that possibility of suicidal ideation. We want to help them to stabilize their behavior, reduce some of their symptoms. Um, that is Phase one is usually what the, the basic staff nurse would be able to do, absolutely. Phase two and three are really for the advanced practice nurse or, again, the psychologist, psychiatrist. I would not in any way, shape, or form um, say that as, as a staff nurse, you should be confronting, working through, and integrating those traumatic memories. That is absolutely beyond uh, beyond our skill set, you know, as a regular staff nurse. And the personality integration and rehabilitating them so they can be a functional human being again, that again is the role of the advanced practice um, person. So implementations, education, very important. So people need education about their illnesses and thank goodness we do this because I do remember years ago how we never told anybody their diagnosis ever. So they never knew they had schizophrenia. It was almost like it was too much of a stigma, like we didn't want them to know it was a big secret. So it's not a secret anymore. We are telling people about their different illnesses. We're teaching them ways to cope. We're teaching them ways to care for themselves. Um, and that's all very positive. Pharmacological interventions, well, there is no magic pill that will cure a um, dissociative personality disorders disorder. So basically, you, they might need to be on medications that might help their high anxiety level, um, their depressed mood, and possibly, you know, sometimes antipsychotics if they're really highly agitated and highly anxious. So there might be some medications that are going to help their symptoms, but really nothing is specifically targeting their symptoms of being of dissociating. So, okay, so then again, advanced some advanced practice interventions, cognitive behavior therapy, different types of therapy, you know, whatever. So that's not something that you as a staff nurse would be doing. Okay, audience response question. A nurse assesses a patient diagnosed with dissociative personality disorder, what finding would likely be part of the patient's history, travel to a foreign country, physical or sexual abuse, thyroid dysfunction, or an eating disorder. Well, 
I'm hoping that you picked B, physical or sexual abuse, because many times that trauma is what stimulates the person to dissociate, and that's really one of the root causes. Um, just, I'm going to say a word about D. There are times when people do have eating disorders along with their dissociative disorders um, because it's just, you know, sometimes eating people with eating disorders also have backgrounds of having trauma, abuse, neglect. Not everyone, but there sometimes there's a little bit of overlap there. But the primary finding would be the physical or sexual abuse. All right, chapter 17, somatic symptom disorders. So we have a little case study. Mr. Brazelli is brought to the emergency department by a cab driver who walks with him to the entrance and says, this guy says he just lost his sight. He just went blind after he got into my cab. Mr. Brazelli is very patient and says during assessment, well, I've had several episodes like this. I guess this just happens sometimes. So again, now maybe you're thinking, oh, come on, really? Is that really likely to happen. And uh, quite honestly, yes, um, I've seen this happen too. Not so much with blindness, but I guess I've seen somebody that had um, the inability to walk and having pseudo seizures because those are some other types of um, kind of like conversion disorders that have happened. So this is kind of a conversion reaction. We'll get to more about that later. That's just something to maybe entice you and say, wow, this is really interesting stuff. Okay, so the concept of somatization is just that stress is expressed through physical symptoms. This is very common. We all do this. We all somaticize from time to time. So if you're upset about something or all keyed up, you're worried about an exam coming or you've got to give an oral care plan presentation, you might find yourself getting a headache, having some muscle tension, neck ache. Um, you might have a backache. You might have a stomach ache, diarrhea, you know, any of those things that are bodily, bodily symptoms. So that's how our psychological um, distress is manifested many times. So that's very, very common. But we're going to talk about some disorders where it really becomes more, more than just, um, you know, a little headache or backache. So symptoms, somatization again, so general broad concept, the symptoms are expressed in place of anxiety, depression, or irritability. So in other words, they're kind of substituting those um, somatic complaints for what's really going on. So they're not able to verbally express their anxiety, their depression, their mood, or their irritability. You know, whatever it is about their mood, they're just not able to express it verbally, so it gets expressed physically. So a holistic approach to take would be that it's a multidimensional interplay of biological, psychological, sociocultural needs, and it just, its effects on somatization. So again, it's very complex. It's not something kind of simple. We have to look at multiple factors when we think about somatizing. All right, so the clinical picture, SS. D. So that is somatic symptom disorder. And no, you don't have to memorize SSD, OCD, all the different PTSD. I will write those out during test questions, so you will not have to worry about memorizing that. So anyways, we have SSD, which is somatic symptom disorder. We have illness, anxiety disorder, conversion disorder, which is that Mr. Brazelli has conversion disorder, psychological factors that affect a medical condition, and factitious disorder. So these are the types of things we're going to be talking about um, in the, the last part of this learning plan too. So again, let's get back to that case study. During assessment, Mr. Brazelli says that when these episodes of blindness come over him, it is often immediately after an epileptic fit, which is in quotation marks. Testing, however, shows no signs of a recent seizure. Hmm, so he doesn't really have a seizure disorder, but sometimes people have, I'm wondering if he has pseudo-seizures, which is like a fake seizure. Some people that have conversion disorder have, as part of their conversion, a seizure, but it's not a real seizure. It is fabricated. So the ED physician records that Mr. Brazelli has neurologic symptoms, but in the absence of a neurologic diagnosis. So in other words, there is no medical reason or neurological reason for his symptoms. So they are psychological. He also makes note of this patient's lack of distress about what should be a very alarming condition. 
So, somatic symptom disorder, you have at least one or more distressing symptoms. Um, you have excessive thoughts, anxiety, and behaviors around their symptoms or health concerns, but it's without significant physical findings and a medical diagnosis. So truly, there is nothing physically wrong with this person. But we have to remember that their suffering is authentic. It's very real to that person. And they do have a high level of functional impairment in terms of um, job, work, school, whatever, taking care of themselves, taking care of their families if they have a family. So they do have a high level of impairment. So if you look in your book, there's a little table on page 316 that just looks at some criteria for those somatic symptom disorder. And many times you have to have, um, the symptoms have to be persistent, usually about probably more than six months. Um, and it's very interesting that there is something called, um, it was previously called pain disorder because sometimes people have, um, pain issues as their somatic symptom. And I remember working with somebody that had like this pain disorder years ago and um, she would actually take off her clothes because she felt like the clothes touching her was causing her so much pain. She would be screaming to the top of her lungs and writhing around on the floor of her room, tearing her clothes off because of this pain, but there was absolutely no physical reason for the pain. Illness anxiety disorder. So this one, you might be familiar with the term hypochondriac or hypochondriasis, because I think that's a word that is kind of used in common language. So if you're a hypochondriac, you're kind of thinking things are wrong with you all the time. Um, so, there, so it's very, you know, it's, it's used to be called that, but I think maybe hypochondriac or hypo, hypochondriasis uh, probably has more of a stigma and a, you know, kind of a negative connotation. But it basically entails the misinterpretation of physical sensations. So, and some of those physical sensations really are quite normal, or they could possibly have something minor wrong with them, but it's not anything, you know, that's really worthy to go see the doctor and, you know, and um, get a diagnosis. And they think maybe their diagnosis is they have cancer because they're misinterpreting something that could be kind of normal, or maybe it's like, yeah, a little something wrong with them, but it's certainly not as big as cancer might be. So they're very preoccupied and the symptoms have to go on for at least six months time period. They have high anxiety about their health and excessive health related behaviors or sometimes maladaptive avoidance, like they won't go to the doctor at all. Quite honestly, I guess I've seen more of the care-seeking rather than care-avoidant types of behaviors. Um, sometimes these people do a lot of like doctor shopping. They'll go to see specialist after specialist after specialist, or they keep changing doctors because they're not hearing from the doctor what they want to hear, so they kind of keep looking for medical care. So they are very, very stressed, um, but they're very difficult to treat. Now this might be the type of person that if they go to medical doctor after medical doctor and specialist after specialist, that they may try to refer them to a psychiatrist. And most of the time the person is not going to be interested in that because they really truly feel and believe that there is something physically wrong and they really don't want to be told that it's all in their head. However, I guess in my way of thinking, all in their head really means that, yes, it is a diagnosable mental illness, but again, because of the stigma, perhaps, that they're not really readily um, going to be accepting that. Conversion disorder. So this is what the um, little case study about Mr. Brazelli is all about. And so conversion disorder is having neurologic symptoms in the absence of a neurologic diagnosis. So in other words, there is nothing neurologically wrong with them, but they do have some symptoms. Um, they have a presence of deficits in voluntary motor or sensory functions. So some of those common conversion symptoms are being paralyzed, so being unable to walk, blindness, movement and gait disorders, numbness, paresthesia, so tingling, loss of vision or hearing, or episodes resembling epilepsy, so something we might call a pseudo-seizure. 
Um, so those are the, the types of things I have seen. I have seen pseudo seizures. Um, I have seen the paralysis. I guess I haven't seen the loss of vision or hearing, but but those are very, you know, the blindness, those are very common one, ones too. I guess personally the ones that I have seen are the um, the paralysis, the, this girl was unable to, um, unable to ambulate, and pseudo seizures I have seen quite a bit of. Um, and labelle indifference versus distress. So labelle indifference is a French term. Just kind of, you can imagine the word indifference is kind of in there. So just imagine that that's what it is. So, um, in the, in the case study about that Mr. Uh, Brazelli, um, he definitely didn't seem too concerned. He was very calm and didn't seem too worried about his um, being blind. So that's what that is. I have another really good example because I took care of um, a girl who had this, and she was my age, and actually I remember her from, um, she went to the same college I did, although I did not know her in, in school. She was not a nursing major. She was majoring in something else. But anyways, I remember seeing her on campus because it was a pretty small campus, so we kind of everybody knew each other. And she was always very loud, boisterous, social, you know, just kind of a loud person. And um, and so when she was on the unit, she was in a wheelchair. And she was not the least bit concerned that she was in a wheelchair and that she could not walk. As a matter of fact, um, I still to this day can remember her um, whipping herself around the unit in that wheelchair, socializing, ordering pizza on the telephone, you know, socializing and talking with other patients. And I remember thinking, wow, she's the same age as me. We're in our mid-20s. I think I'd be pretty concerned if I was all of a sudden unable to walk and in a wheelchair. And she had absolutely not a care in the world. And so you're probably wondering, what in the world is that all about? And the reason for that labelle indifference is that because this is the conversion disorders, all these somatic disorders, are, are under the umbrella of an anxiety disorder, all of the anxiety gets bound up and tied up and wrapped up in a bow with um, for in that particular symptom, and so they don't experience any anxiety. So it kind of frees up their their emotional state to not experience that anxiety because all their anxiety is tied up into that physical symptom. So if you have any questions about that, shoot me an email, or we can talk about it during, um, you know, during clinical. But anyways, it is something that is kind of really difficult to understand. So, psychological factors affecting a medical condition. So, psychological factors that increase risk for medical diseases magnify them or interfere with their treatment. So, we have to think about depression absolutely for sure will affect medical conditions. So if somebody is depressed, there is an impact on cardiovascular diseases and cancer. And of course, stress overall is going to affect almost every medical condition that you can think of. There is actually a quote in your book um, at the top of page 318 that says that um, depression is such a powerful condition that is a, it is associated with increased risk of death from nearly all major medical causes. So that's pretty um, pretty profound. And I do think then we need to take depression seriously. And well, that's the next learning plan. But anyways, um, depression, stress, anxiety, all of those work together and they really can affect medical conditions very deeply. So again, lots of reasons to be doing some teaching that depression is an illness and it's not a character flaw or a weakness as some people think that it is. Okay, another audience response question. Which diagnosis best describes Mr. Brazelli's condition? So I'm hoping that you will pick D, conversion disorder. So all of a sudden he can't see, that would be a conversion disorder. Assessment. So we're looking at all the psychosocial factors, somebody's coping skills, their spirituality and religion, whether the religion and spiritual beliefs are, are helpful or if they're hindering. Sometimes beliefs might hinder a person's wellness because um, if they, perhaps if their beliefs say that they should be just maybe using Maybe they should be using prayer instead of anything else. They should not be using Western medicine, medications, therapy, or anything else like that. Then hmm, they're not probably likely to be very you know, compliant and get better. So we're looking at 
um, when we're looking at these somatic disorders, we're looking for secondary gains. And so you're probably thinking, what in the world is secondary gains? And it's kind of like it's the goodies that we get from being sick. So I'll give an example. When I broke my foot several years ago, I just, I was on crutches for a while and I really couldn't do much like around the house. I couldn't do housework. Um, I couldn't, it was hard to cook because I was on crutches. So it was kind of nice actually to kind of get away with not doing the things that I usually could do or had to do that were my job. So that's secondary gains. It's like, ah, oh, I don't have to do that now. Somebody else is going to do that for me. So it could be like all the attention and positive stuff that we get from being sick. Sometimes when we're sick, we find that people are falling around us more and they're just bending over backwards to help us and maybe giving us gifts or doing things that are like above and beyond that make you feel really good. So that's what we're, what we're thinking about. Is somebody getting secondary gains from their somatic symptoms? And we're always looking at their cognitive style because, of course, that has to do with how they're, you know, they're thinking, they're feeling, their thoughts, and then their behaviors, their ability to communicate their feelings and their emotional needs. Some people are better, better doing, better apt to do this than others. Some people find it really difficult to communicate um, their emotional state. Um, their dependence on medication. We sure don't want to get people dependent on medications, and that's why many times meds are used that are not um, you know, not addictive types of medications. So we do want to assess that. And again, always do a self-assessment because sometimes these patients can be very frustrating to work with or they may bring out negative reactions in us or we just might not even think that it's a real diagnosis. And so if we really think that way, we should probably do some reading, do some research and talk to other practitioners that have cared for patients with that disorder and see how they're coping um, because that really is something that's important. We have to be um, effective and we have to do a self-diagnosis and understand our own thoughts and feelings in order to be effective for that person. So some nursing diagnoses that apply to the somatic disorders, ineffective coping, anxiety, risk for loneliness, powerlessness, hopelessness, social isolation, pain, altered family processes, and absolutely risk for suicide. So those are all some diagnoses that we would have to worry about um, with people that have these types of disorders. And when we identify our outcomes or goals, we always want to do that in conjunction with the patient. What is the patient's goal? So we really have to get their participation. And we have to make the criteria realistic and attainable, usually go in very small steps or increments. So you can't go from somebody wheeling themselves all over in a wheelchair and not caring at all to just like standing up out of that wheelchair and being able to cope appropriately with, with their life's issues. It's really got to be done in very, very small increments. And this way the patient can see concrete evidence of progress and they're going to, you know, that will increase them feeling better about themselves, increase their self-esteem and their confidence. So the implementation, some other types of therapeutic interventions is always that communication, that relationship with the patient, um, educate them, refer them to support groups or support systems, teach effective coping and focus on their strengths and reinforce their skills. Everyone has strengths. So there's six key elements for effective treatment. Provide continuity of care, avoid unnecessary procedures. So when the person who really believes there's something wrong with them is insisting on procedures, we really don't want to just let that person go through surgery just to, you know, get them off your back or give them a medication just because, you know, so they'll go away and we'll, you know, they won't be bugging us so much anymore. We really don't want to do any anything unnecessary. Um, we might have to provide free, brief, frequent, regular visits with that person. Always conduct a physical exam because you sure don't want to miss something that might be real. So as far as our nursing assessment, um, we always want to do a thorough physical head-to-toe nursing assessment because we might find that there is a real valid medical reason for their complaint. So you always want to make sure that we do do give them a thorough workup. And as far as our role as a nurse, 
we would want to talk to the doctor about getting a thorough medical workup. If the doctor is resistant, I think there would be reasons that we can advocate for the patient, and we really want to make sure that we're not missing something that is really going on before we say it is a psychological disorder. So, and avoid disparaging comments. So in other words, we really don't want to say things to the patient that um, is going to make them feel badly about themselves. Again, it's not their fault. They can't help it if they're in a wheelchair and they're, or they're, they have so many somatic complaints and they really believe they've got cancer, they've got a terrible illness. You know, we can't say things to the patient that's going to make them feel bad. You know, like, oh, you're coming in for so many visits and you're using up my time and I really need to spend time on other people that are really sick. We don't ever want to say things like that. We always want to set realistic, reasonable, achievable, therapeutic goals with that person. So part of the implementation then is the psychosocial. So coping strategies that preclude somatization. So we want to um, help them to think of ways that they used to cope with things before they somaticized. Because most of us developed some coping mechanisms with something, <laughs> you know. Um, if, if you really think back, there might be some things we can all think of in our own experiences, that ways that we learned to cope with something like from childhood. So what kind of coping strategies did they used to use before they started somaticizing? Because maybe some of those were healthy. If they if they use some unhealthy ones, we sure don't want them going back to using other unhealthy coping mechanisms. Always we're going to be promoting the self-care activities, just taking good care of themselves, eating, sleeping, drinking enough fluids, um, showering, hygiene, all that kind of thing. They might, might need some help with assertiveness training because part of these somatic illnesses is they, they really don't express themselves very well verbally. And when people become assertive, they're able to get their needs met without stepping on the toes of anybody else. So they really get their needs met in a very nice way. And they sometimes need to um, set limits with other people and to do it in a way, again, that's just very assertive. So assertiveness training can be huge. Pharmacologic interventions, again, there aren't too many specific meds that treat these illnesses, but certainly we can treat the symptoms of, of anxiety, panic, whatever, depression, um, health teaching and promotion, and case management, because sometimes if they are seeking um, the health care from too many different types of practitioners, they actually might need a case manager to kind of manage things for them a little bit to help them kind of curtail that list down and maybe only see one or two types of practitioners, but maybe not six. So advanced practice interventions, again, that's psychotherapy, or they might serve as a consultant to give advice. Um, we always want to take that holistic approach and think about the whole person. Cognitive behavior therapy, they may act as a nurse consultant or a liaison. So the evaluation is based on clear, realistic, measurable outcomes. So we always want to evaluate our interventions, just again, part of that nursing process. And the goals are often reported as partially met, maybe not all the way met, but at least if they're partially met, then that's a positive. So the patients might often report continuing somatic symptoms, but hopefully we're, we're um, hoping that they are going to report less concern about them. So they're just not as concerned as they used to be. So factitious disorder is artificially, deliberately, and dramatically fabricating symptoms or their self-inflicting injury. And that goal is assuming a sick role. And it's part of a, a kind of has a compulsive characteristic to it. So I've actually taken care of people with this. And um, there was actually um, a husband and wife that I cared for a long time ago. And they would intermittently come into the hospital. First, the wife would come in and um, the wife would have injected herself with dirty, using dirty needles with, um, with saline and dirty needles and inject that into her, usually into her legs or kind of hip area. 
and and then develop cellulitis. So then she'd have to come into the hospital, get some IV antibiotics, and then she'd get better and go home. And then next thing you know, the husband would be admitted and he would also be injecting himself with using dirty needles. Usually it was saline and they injected dirty using dirty needles. And of course, then he would also get the cellulitis and need to be on IV antibiotics. And so this, when they're in that sick role, what they get out of it is that, oh, somebody is taking care of me. And so they really feel like rescued and helped by medical professionals. And the behavior is, it really does take on a compulsive flair because I just remember these two people just continuing that behavior for quite a long period of time, for years. And again, one would be well and then they'd go home and then the next one would be, you know, they would be coming into the hospital. So I do think that they kind of, um, kind of fed off of each other in some ways. So factitious disorder actually can be imposed on themselves, um, or if if they have these same types of behaviors where they're purposefully tampering or fabricating symptoms, but usually they're actually physically tampering with themselves or with somebody else, then that is called Munchausen syndrome. So Munchausen's by proxy is when they are doing it to another person. So, well, actually, yeah, the, uh, the most popular form or most, most common form of fact, let me just back up. <laughs> the most common form of that factitious disorder is Munchausen's. But if it's um, Munchausen's by proxy, it is usually a parent doing some kind of physical tampering to create symptoms in their child. Yes, that is a form of child abuse. So if they're doing it to somebody else by proxy, then usually they get a lot of rewards by getting the attention and the excitement of um, rescuing that person. They've rushed their child to the emergency room because they have a terrible fever or they're having unrelenting nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and they rush them to the emergency room and then they kind of get some, like some positives out of that. So that, that's kind of what drives them to do that type of behavior. So, um, so we just talked about self and others, and then, then malingering is, is something else that's kind of related to factitious disorders. Um, but usually with malingering, there is, there was something going on, but now you're kind of milking it for all it's worth. So I don't know if you know what that phrase means, but basically, um, you're either fabricating or you're exaggerating something that really happened to get that secondary gain of maybe insurance fraud. You're going to get some medications, especially some, maybe some narcotic medications, or you're avoiding prison or avoiding military servants or service, or somehow you get out of responsibilities that you should be doing. So that is kind of what malingering is. So I guess, um, Maybe my example of like when I broke my when I broke my foot and I was on crutches and I was like getting out of things. Um, if I were to continue that like way longer after I was off crutches and I would make excuses for why I couldn't do something like, oh, no, I really can't do laundry because, oh, you know, my, my foot, it's really acting up today. So that would kind of be malingering. It's you're just milking it for all it's worth. You're trying to get away with stuff for as long as you possibly can. But with malingering, though, there might have been something that's really there. It could be fabricated, but more than likely, um, it's at least something that actually it was a physical problem. So again, the nursing process, you're probably tired of this by now, but um, anyways. So, you know, as far as our assessment, I guess we can kind of try to assess, determine if the symptoms are conscious or unconscious. Um, avoid confronting the person. Again, that self-assessment frustrations can be, we might have frustrations related to that counter-transference. Maybe this person kind of reminds us of somebody and so we're going to have a negative reaction to them and maybe not be very therapeutic to them. Um, planning and implementation, monitoring them for safety, preventing dangerous, unnecessary treatments. And of course, we're going to be trying to see if they can use those new coping strategies when we're evaluating them. So a, an audience response question, what's an example of malingering? Mr. Harris injures his foot to avoid military service. 
Mrs. Adams has been making her child vomit and lose weight to pretend he has cancer. Mr. Singleton has difficulty walking and uses a wheelchair, but without neurological deficits, which began two months after the death of his wife of 32 years. Mr. Monini, who I don't know where they get these names from, but frequently calls or comes to the clinic in a panic, believing she's ill. Her suffering is genuine, but she never has concrete signs of any illness. So I'm hoping that you picked A, that he injures his foot to avoid military service, so that could be an example of malingering, and B, I'm hoping that you know that that would be Munchausen's by proxy. C, I'm hoping that you realize that that one would be a conversion reaction. So now he has difficulty walking and uses a wheelchair, so it's a conversion disorder. Mr. Manini, let's see. Oh, so that would have been, that would be one of those um, somatic symptom disorders or illness disorder, which we used to call hypochondriac. So, audience response question. Oh, well, what in the world? What's an example of an illness anxiety disorder? You know what? I think I just maybe gave you, I think I just gave you the answer to that one. So, so that would be, that would be D. So I believe this is the end of this learning plan. So see you again for learning plan three.